you for the update. Make sure that you pray for Brother Gabe every day. Uh, part of the big burden is just mental and spiritual. It's like uh, having a bunch of kids to think about all the time and to pray about. So you make sure that you uh, pray for uh, Brother Gabe. Goes to bed with New Testament Church, wakes up with New Testament Church, works his secular job with New Testament Church. And uh, it's the way it is, isn't it, brother? So you make sure to pray for him. Uh, I'm sure that he'll appreciate it very much. Well, it's a delight to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Let me see, 7 o'clock Wednesday, we're going to be in the book of James, James 2, 1 through 10. God is not a respecter of persons. Praise the Lord. You should be glad for that this morning, you commoners. Talking to myself, too. And uh, that God uh, does not respect persons. And uh, we'll be there. And, of course, we'll put our, our minds together and hearts together in prayer. Seek the Lord's face. Uh, ladies, 10 o'clock Friday, you have your prayer meeting. And uh, I know there's been a good amount of ladies coming out to that and doing some Bible study and doing some uh, praying together. And then Saturday at 1030, we've been having a good group come out on Saturday. Got a bunch of spiritual teenagers. The spiritual, the teenagers are going to overtake this church. You know that spiritually, you know they're leading the way, and uh, so we are praising God for that. You see, um, there's nothing, there's nothing more refreshing to a church than having spiritual teenagers, and there's nothing more depressing to a church than having unspiritual teenagers. Uh, and so we are thankful for those coming out on Saturday. Uh, so be in your place this Saturday, and we're uh, working in the village of of. I was going to say Black River. That's the wrong town. In the village of Webster. Uh, and so we're going through the village there. And uh, it's been a joy to do so. So we're in Psalms 37 tonight. One of the uh, favorite Psalms. There's Psalms chapter number 37. And we're going to look at about seven verses there. But we're going to jump back and forth through the Psalm. And I uh, know if the Lord helps us, it'll be a blessing and a refreshment to us tonight. So Psalms 37, and when you find your place there, we will stand together for the reading of God's Word. Psalms 37, starting verse number 1, and we're going to read down through verse number 7. Psalms 37, verse number 1. Fret not thyself because of evil doers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass, and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord, and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as a light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Look, if you will, to verse number 37. Mark the perfect man, and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. And uh, we'll be talking about the perfect man, some attributes of the perfect man from Psalms 37. So let's go to the Lord one more time tonight. Let's ask his blessing upon the word this evening. Let's pray. Lord, we, we love you. We thank you for being such a wonderful God to us. Lord, we thank you just for being our Savior. We thank you for eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We thank you for our home in heaven. We thank you for the Holy Spirit tonight. Uh, we thank you that we have the privilege of being the temple of the Holy Ghost individually and corporately. We're a, a habitation of God through the Spirit. We thank you just for the privilege it is to have the Lord Jesus Christ walk in the midst of our church. And Lord, we count him as present tonight. And Lord, we pray that you would bless your word. I pray that the Lord Jesus would be lifted up in our midst. Help us to see the Lord through. Uh, the word tonight, I pray that our hearts would be submitted to your word. I pray that our eyes and our ears would be open to the word and the heart would be ready to receive these things. We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. You may be seated. So when you're studying a portion of scripture, a lot of times you look for the key verse or usually is a giveaway 
uh, that tells you the thrust of the verse. It tells you the thesis of the portion of Scripture. And for Psalms 37, it would be verse number 37. And so it says, Mark the perfect man. Uh, there's different people you're supposed to mark in the Bible. You're supposed to mark those who walk so, and you can uh, imitate, and you can mimic their behavior. You know, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Uh, so there's the, the righteous man, uh, you know, Philippians. I preached a sermon, picking a winning team and winning. <laughs> you have to, the only way you're going to win in the Christian life is picking a winning team. Okay, you can't live the Christian life alone. Uh, you know, even the Lone Ranger had Tonto remember uh, and so you have to be in that, uh, that cloud of witnesses you got to be running the race along with your company along with your tribe so you're going to mark uh, you are to mark a perfect man so you're going to mark those who walk so and then you're also to walk those who do not walk so and avoid them so it says mark the perfect man uh, so in the book of James we've been looking at the perfect man and the perfect man uh, has spiritual maturity and he has gained his spiritual maturity through adversity. Understand uh, that a tree, uh, that if it is an environment where the wind doesn't blow, you know, we're over in West Webster and the wind blows quite a bit there. We've got some giant trees around our house. Makes me a little nervous. Uh, you know, when it gets 60, 70 miles an hour, especially after Chuck and Lori's story about the bicycle rider and the limb fell upon his bicycle right in front of their house. and almost killed the guy, hit his helmet. And, uh, and, but, uh, but you know, those trees are really, really strong. And what the wind does, the adversity, it, it makes those roots grow down deeper and wider, and they're more strong because of the adversity which they face. So it says, mark the perfect man or the mature man. We know that there is no sinless man, uh, but there is the perfecting of the saints, the maturing of the saints. We're in the school of faith, and we want to be mature men and women of God. This is going to come by adversity. So it says, Mark the perfect man, and behold the upright man. For the end of that man is peace. There is a man in the Bible who the Bible says was perfect and upright in all of his ways. Who is that? Job. Job. Uh, and so did Job's... Was Job's faith tried? Yes, and when I am tried, I shall come forth as gold. So the end of that man is peace. Now the Bible, what uh, the, the Lord offers us through His Word supernaturally uh, is peace. The peace, the Bible says, that passes all understanding. Uh, and so you, we're going to see the contrast between the righteous and the wicked tonight. And the difference between the righteous and the wicked uh, is going to be just one thing. It's going to be peace. So if I gave you a blank piece of paper and I said, write down all the things that you need in your life to make you happy. And you wrote down a big house, fancy car, nice job, uh, nice vacation, yada, yada, uh, all these things. There's people that have those things. But let me ask you a question. Are they happy? Do they have peace? Uh, and the answer is, unless they know the Lord, they do not have peace. Uh, the Bible talks about peace is something that is set and something that has nothing to do with the trials that you are in. So no matter what uh, you're facing tonight, you might have the worst circumstances in the whole wide world, but you can still have peace. It says in Colossians, set your affections on things above. So just like I can go over to that thermostat right now, if I had my way, I'd set it at about 55 degrees. Yeah, and man, nobody would, I mean, everybody would be paying attention. No one would even think about closing their eyes. It'd be way too cold to go to sleep. And I would be very comfortable up here with my suit on. And uh, it'd probably be bad. I'd probably preach for several hours. I would feel so refreshed and empowered. Uh, but you go over there and you set a thermostat, but a thermometer is based upon the circumstances around. Uh, so if you are not spiritual, if you are not mature, you're going to be the thermometer that's just reacting to the circumstances around you. You will not be that thermostat that is setting your affections. Uh, and so this is very important for us. Um, Let's look at verse number one. Okay, so this perfect man says, Mark the perfect man, behold the upright man, for the end of that man is peace. 
So one of the first attributes of the perfect man, of the perfect woman, of the mature person uh, in the Lord is that they are not fretting. So the perfect man frets not. Notice in verse number one, it says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Uh, there's warriors, there's fretters, and there are those who have peace. Uh, we uh, preached a camp this week, and I can't even remember what sermon it was, but the point was made, and this is true throughout the Bible, there's two categories of Christians. Uh, there is worshipers, and there are complainers. So either you have your eyes on Jesus, or you have your eyes on this present evil world. Uh, so there is a big question in this life, why do good things happen to bad people? Why do bad things happen to good people? The Bible tells us it rains on the just and the unjust alike. Uh, look at Luke chapter number, don't look at it. Luke chapter number 13. Uh, the Lord had this uh, question for those who had, um, who had the same inquiry. Uh, he said, Upon whom the tower of Shalom fell, you suppose those men wicked than all those that were around them. I tell you, yea, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And so there was a great tragedy. The tower of Shalom, it fell down and killed a bunch of people. Uh, and the Lord said, Do you think that those people who the tower fell on were more wicked than the rest of you? Uh, nay, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Uh, so the perfect man frets not because of the evil world which is around him. What he does is he takes the long view, the long view. Look, if you will, to verse number 16. Verse number 16. It says, A little that the righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. Uh, and here's the reason why verse 16 is true. Number one, um, the rich do not have the power from above to enjoy their riches. You know what the Bible says? There is no peace for the wicked. There is no trouble. The, the wicked are like a troubled sea. Um, I remember a gal I worked with in the meat department. Uh, she said, I, I just can't uh, get any peace. I said, well, you know, there's no rest for the wicked, it says in the Bible. Um, and... You know my sense of humor. But uh, it, she said, does it, the Bible really say that? I said, yeah, it really does. There is no rest for the wicked. The wicked are as a troubled sea. They cannot get rest. So you might have much riches, but you cannot have any eternal satisfaction. Uh, the little that the righteous man had is better. Why? Because he has the power to enjoy these things. Uh, and so a man who knows the Lord and loves the Lord can sit down and it tells us in 1 Timothy uh, that having food and raiment therewith to be content. Your quorum for contentment in this life. So let me see. Everybody's got clothes on tonight. How many ate today? Okay. How many ate a lot? today. Uh, and so we with the Lord can rest content in him uh, because of what we have. Look, if you will, to verse number seven. It says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. So you turn on the news tonight. Uh, and what they're going to tell, those little fear mongers that sit behind that desk, those little empty suits, reading off a prompter, they're selling fear. And let me tell you something, fear sells. So Chicken Little is going to tell you tonight, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, and can you believe what Nancy Pelosi is doing now? And you're fretting because of evildoers and the wicked devices they are bringing to pass. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Why doesn't God do something about this? You know that David had the same thought, uh, and he says, My feet almost slipped, meaning I almost apostatized. I almost threw in the towel and threw in the faith because I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Look, if you will, to verse number 35. I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself 
like a Green Bay tree. Remember Nebuchadnezzar uh, and his dream about the big tree? Yes, and um, the tree was so great, this doesn't prove the world is flat, okay? But everybody in all the ends of the world could see this great tree. And then it says, all the birds of the air lodged in this great tree. And all nations did seek this great tree. And then there was a watcher. There was a holy one that came down from heaven. And it, here's one angel. Thunk. And this big old tree comes crashing down to the ground. And that's exactly what God did to Nebuchadnezzar. So I saw the wicked as a great, great green bay tree, this emblem of strength. Verse number 36, yet... He passed away, and lo, he was not. Yea, I sought him, but he could not be found. Look at me well quickly to Psalms 73. Psalms number 73. Truly, God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. You know, we... Saying it's amazing what praising can do. Hallelujah. Uh, and so here it starts off with the praise in verse number one. Verse number two, here's a testimony of what almost happened when he wasn't looking at the Lord. The psalmist wasn't looking at the Lord. He was looking at the wicked and all their prosperity and all their power and all their success. Look at verse number two. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Goes on to describe the wicked, but then look at verse number 17. He says, Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. Uh, so, you know, you look at prosperous, powerful politicians and political world leaders, you look at the oligarchy. You know, you look at the Bill Gates and the George Soros and the Fauci's of this world. Uh, instead of looking on them with, with contempt and scorn, we ought to look on them with pity. Because there is a day coming that they are going to stand before God. I remember when I was a kid hearing uh, guys preaching, you know, um, and, you know, they're preaching against rock music. And then, you know, all these rock stars die in their youth. A lot of them did, you know. And they'll say, so-and-so died, God killed him. And then, how about the Rolling Stones? Aren't they like all in their 80s? And the explanation was, God's keep, or no, the, the devil's keeping them alive. I said, well, God can't kill them, but because the devil's, <laughs> let me tell you something. It's all in God's hands. And you know, you know what wicked people do? Is they add to iniquity and add to iniquity and add to the iniquity and we are to take pity on them because their hell is going to be so horrendous when they have to stand before a holy God. So he takes the long view. We take the long view of the wicked's eternity. And then we also take the long view of your eternity and my eternity. So turn back to Psalms 37. Psalms 37 in verse Number 10, it says, For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. You know, Solomon talks about they think their names are going to go on forever. But let me tell you, one generation, they're going to be forgotten. And even all the buildings that are named after them, yeah, people still call the building by its name, but they'll forget the person behind the building. They won't even know who it is. Then after a while, somebody will come and tear down their monument, and then they'll be forgotten. Uh, and so... The wicked will be no more. Now, remember when the Lord Jesus was tempted in the wilderness? Uh, so he was all points tempted like you and I are, yet without sin. So I think the temptations in the wilderness that the devil is laying out is full weight upon Christ. I believe the, temp the devil tempts you and I in the same capacity with the same temptations. Uh, remember that one of the things that the God of this world... Uh, does He says, if you bow down and worship me, I will give you all the kingdoms of this world. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. You can choose either, either to worship the God of this present world or capital G God of heaven. And you know what it says? Look at um, 
Look at verse number 11. It says on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is preaching. The meek shall do what? You remember? Inherit the earth. So in the millennial reign of Christ, I don't have to worry about, um, you know, Webster and, the, you know, and getting my uh, chunk of power and property and prestige here in the millennium. I'm going to be the mayor of Webster. I don't know. But, uh, but it says the meek will inherit the earth. So here's what the devil is trying to tempt Christ with. Here's what he tries to, to tempt uh, you with today. Uh, he, tr he says, go ahead and take this fallen kingdom now. Christ says, no, I'll wait. I'm going to worship the Lord, my God, and I'm going to come back, and he is going to rule and reign preeminent uh, in a perfect world with a perfect government, with a perfect kingdom. Without will be no end. So look at, uh, look at verse number 11. It says, And the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of, what's that next word? Peace. Peace. So the perfect man does not fret. Another thing about the perfect man is they trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Uh, it's very easy many times in our life uh, to not trust in the Lord. Uh, we were singing the song just a little bit earlier. Faith is a victory that overcomes the world. So let's, let's sing the opposite. Unbelief is the defeat that, I don't know, you can come up with it. Uh, and so if faith is a victory, unbelief is your enemy. So it says this perfect man, he is going to trust in the Lord and he's going to be fed. Remember the Lord in the Sermon on the Mount? Uh, and he says, think not for your life, what ye shall eat, what ye shall drink, what ye shall put on. He says, take no thought for the morrow, uh, for, the, for the things of, of uh, tomorrow, the sufficient is the evil uh, thereof. Uh, he says, if God clothes uh, uh, the fields and the lilies with the grass. He says, won't he much more clothe you, O ye of little faith. Um, David says here in this psalm, if you would look at, let's see here, verse number 25, he says, I have been young and now am I old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. And so here the psalmist is going to rest in the Lord. He's not going to worry about tomorrow. So Christ says, take no thought for tomorrow. Um, look, if you will, to verse number four. He's going to trust in the Lord. He's going to delight himself in the Lord as well. And this has to do with trusting in the Lord. Um, you know, Christ said, the light of the body is the eye. Uh, if your eye be evil, your whole body is full of darkness. But if your eye be full of light, how great is that light? So you have an option in this life to t look at one of two places. I remember Peter, we give him grief for sinking, uh, you know, when he steps out of the boat. But notice that none of the other disciples stepped out of the boat in faith. It was only Peter who stepped out of the boat. Uh, and remember when he started walking on water, there's, here's the way to walk on water, is that you keep your eyes upon Jesus. So it says you delight yourself in the Lord, trust also in Him, and He shall bring it to pass. And so there's two ways that we're going to trust in the Lord and delight ourselves in the Lord. We are going to look at the Lord for direction, and we're going to look at the Lord for this present day in which we live. Um, look if you look down at um, verse number 23. Verse number 23. It says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Now, you know the Bible is a two-edged sword, right? Um, so it, the steps of a good man. 
So think about the precision of this. I remember when uh, I worked at the grocery store and, uh, at one time in my uh, career, and the truck would come in on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for the meat deli. And the meat deli, the hot dogs, the bologna, the cheeses, all that stuff, it was like 40 to 60% profit. We made the most amount of money in the meat department off of that uh, particular section, and it was entrusted to yours truly. And I never saw any of that profit, you know, kick back to me other than my hourly paycheck. Uh, but uh, that was my job. It was pretty nice. I'd come in at 5 o'clock in the morning when the truck came in. Uh, and I would work straight, not take a lunch break. Uh, and then the human resources person always used to get with me about everything. Jack, you need to start taking lunch breaks. You can't skip lunch break. I say, okay, and I'd do it for about a week and then start skipping lunch breaks after that. Uh, but I would, work from, uh, I would work from 5 in the morning till 12 noon, eight hours straight, man, really quickly, and then I would be done for the day, man. Right, I was man. free walking out of the store and uh, go work that counter. And I remember, uh, I remember one of the times where I was uh, just working and, you know, just duly saved and really just delighting in the Lord, talking to the Lord, and I was thinking about the steps of the Lord, I'm thinking, the Lord's guiding my hands here. And it was just plain as day. Now, I wish I could tell you this happens all the time, um, but it doesn't, probably because I'm not that <laughs> spiritual. But uh, it happened this day, I'll tell you what, but I, was talk I was talking to the Lord, and I was thinking about the Lord guiding every step all up and down this counter, and I was telling the Lord, this is His counter. If it turns any, any, any glory, any pat on the back that I get, it's all going to be reflected back to me. You know, this is yours. I commit this uh, section unto you, and I'm having a good old time talking to the Lord. And, I mean, just as plain as day, uh, my, the Lord told me, He says, you need to tell, I was just newly saved, probably saved for six months or something like this, you need to tell Ronnie, Ronnie Marshall, who is my boss, you need to tell him about your salvation. And I said, okay, Lord, but we're going to have to go to lunch together. And I want to tell you, this happened one time, it never happened again, because you don't leave. In retail, you never leave. It's not like the post office, okay, where you shut down for, you know, sorry, we're on lunch. I can't help you. <laughs> that, that, you can't do that. In a grocery store, you've got to keep on working. So oh, somebody always has to be back in the meat department. And I knew how to cut all the meat and everything like that. Uh, so the boss and myself couldn't go to lunch together. You just didn't do that. Um, and I'm telling you, this happened one time. It never happened again. And so Ronnie comes over and says, hey, Jake, let's go to lunch together today. I'm buying. And I'm, oh, oh. I mean, I, and <laughs> so the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. You know what? I was delighting in the way. But, you know, this works two ways, two-edged sword. Also, the Lord was delighting in my way because I was recognizing my steps along the way, and he was guiding my steps. Now, George Mueller, um, we put this insert in the bulletin uh, a few times, but it, there's a wonderful uh, advice. Now, he, he pastored a good-sized church, and then he ran the orphanage. A lot of you have read about uh, George Mueller's orphanages, uh, but he just had a powerful prayer life. He logged 50,000 answers to prayer. You can read that in George Mueller's autobiography. Uh, and, and he talked about, he first started uh, in his devotional life. He, get, he was a wicked man, pickpocket, and uh, God saved him out of a wicked lifestyle. He said he'd get up early in the morning, he'd start reading his Bible, and he said it's just hard for him to get in communion with the Lord. And, um, and he said he'd try to pray first before he read his Bible. He'd pray and pray and pray. He's like, it felt like it was 20 minutes before I was even really in communication with God. Have you ever been there before? Uh, so he says, what do you do is open up and meditate upon a passage. And, he, and here's the title of his little charge. Make yourself happy in the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord. He says, I'm going to be happy in Christ Jesus. Remember, there's only two, two types of Christians, worshipers and complainers. Either, your eyes are either going to be on Jesus or they're going to be on your circumstances around you. And we live in a fallen world. Everything is, is going down, okay? And so if you're looking vertically and not horizontally, if you're looking horizontally, not vertically, okay, you're not going to be delighting. Uh, so he said, every day I will make myself happy in the Lord. Well, in Psalms 37, right in the margin of his Bible, so he wrote in his Bible as well, where it says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, he wrote off in the margin, and the stops too. 
The steps and the stops are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Look at the next verse. Though he fall, he will not be utterly cast down. Uh, if you have your eyes on the Lord, uh, it says that he's going to direct your steps. And yes, you know what? A just man falls seven times, but a just man has one more get up than he has fall down. Uh, so if you were looking at the Lord, when you stumble down, you're not going to say, oh man, I did it again, and I this, and I'm such a loser, and I just can't. No, nope. you're going to take your eyes off yourself, and guess where you're going to put them? You're going to put them up on the Lord. So delight yourself also in the Lord. I want you to look at the next thing. It says, verse number 5, it says, Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in Him, and He shall bring it to pass. Look at, um, look at verse number 31. It says, The law of God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. Here's how we commit our way unto the Lord. Remember, um, the Lord says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you, what's the next word? Rest. Rust. Commit your way unto the Lord. Um, I was reading about a missionary, John Patton, to the New Hebrides, famous missionary. And, uh, of course, he was a missionary to uh, the, the people, the Hebrides. There were cannibals there. Uh, but he finally got to the point where he was able to learn the language, which was very, very hard for him to do. Uh, and then he was translating the Bible. And he said when he came across faith, they did not have a good word for faith. He says he was hunting with the natives. And uh, it was a hot day. They were hunting some sort of, I think, a little deer on the island, if I remember the, st the story correctly. And uh, again, he's translating the Bible and trying to come up with different words to translate into their language. And um, they said, why don't, you why don't you stretch yourself out on the shade? And the word they use, stretch yourself out on, he says, that's the word that I'm using for faith. So when it says, commit thy way unto the Lord. So we cast our burdens upon the Lord. And so it's kind of like, you know, your pilgrim and pilgrim's progress. You've got this heavy burden upon you. Heard about one traveler, one pilgrim. Someone comes by uh, in a, a, uh, a horse and buggy or in a wagon. and says, hop on for a ride. And he hops on for a ride and... He's still got the burden on his back. He says, you can take your burden off if you would like. And so here's what we do with our burden, is that our way, our life, we're committing that to the Lord. And it says here, again, look at verse number 31. The law of his God is in his heart, and none of his steps shall slide. When we commit our way into the Lord... Uh, we're finding out what he says in his word about the burden that he has put in our heart, and we're resting that in him. Look at verse number 6. So it says, Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he will bring it to pass. And it says, And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as a light, and thy judgment as the noon day. It says in verse number 7, Rest in in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. When you commit your way in the Lord and you say, Lord, this particular thing that's the burden on my heart tonight, uh, and each and every one of you, if you're human tonight, you've got some sort of burden. <laughs> Ernie's not human, but all the rest of us, all the rest of us carrying a burden, some sort of a burden. I don't care what your age is. You know, youngsters have their own burden and it's just as real. You know, 10 years from now, I'll look back at the burden, you know, whatever burden's on my heart tonight. I'm like, man, Jake, why were you so worried about that? Why didn't you just trust in the Lord with that burden? So I say, here's what the Lord wants me to do with my burden, and I commit that unto him. And when I commit that unto him, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. There is no rest for the wicked. I remember my, one of my bosses, Barbara, she was going on a cruise. 
And I remember, this was like months out, she was talking about that cruise about every day. So we'd be in there cutting, and she said, I can't wait for my cruise. I, I bought the cutest dress for this cruise. I'm like, hey, you know, oh yeah, every day, something cruise. We're, we're gonna, when I end the cruise, we have the opportunity to do this and do that. Every day is a cruise. And, uh, and I remember her going, finally going off on her cruise. And then coming back, how was your cruise? It was awful. The food was terrible. We got sick, which, you know, only like, there's a 50-50 chance. I mean, so go ahead and go on your cruise. There's a 50% chance you won't get sick on a cruise. Uh, and we were sick and this and that. And the, you know what she was looking for in her heart that she was hoping to find on that cruise? Rest. But you know, rest is available for you and I tonight. The peace that passes on understanding. Remember Paul wrote that? He wrote that to the Philippian church. You know, remember what happened there in Philippi? Paul and Silas were beaten. They're put in stocks. After you're beaten, here's the torture part. Here's the bad part. Beating is not the worst part. Put in stocks and stretched out. When your back's been torn apart with beating, that's the bad part. Now, I would have been tempted to be calling curses down from God. Oh, God, smite. imprecatory psalms. That's what I would be singing. You know, destroy mine enemies, smite them. Oh, Father, uh, you know, this is what I would be praying. Uh, but Paul and Silas are singing praises unto God. You know what they, they have there in stocks after being beaten? They have rest. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Don't fret because the evildoers take the long view. Remember, the meek shall inherit the earth. It's all going to be yours anyway. Rest in the Lord. Wait patiently upon Him. And so commit your way unto the Lord. Trust in the Lord. And then finally, rest in God. The Lord, mark the perfect man, behold the upright man, the end of that man, that woman, is peace. Let's stop there. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for Psalms 37. And what a, what a wonderful, wonderful treasure it is. And Lord, we thank you uh, just for the great and exceeding precious promises found in the Word of God. We thank you for the illumination, the instruction that it gives us. Lord, I pray that you'd help us. Uh, we, we've all who are saved here tonight have tasted and seen that the Lord's good. We've tasted a little, little bit of that peace from above. But Lord, I pray that we would truly just have just a, 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 uh, just a supernatural uh, infusion of, of heavenly peace. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to fret not, commit our way into the Lord, trust in you, and rest in you. Lord, help us to be perfect, mature men and women of God and have the end of our way be peace. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name.